Great. All right. Again, my name is Andrew Holly. I work for American Innovations. My colleague, Becky Gibbs-Murray, and I ran an experiment, and we'd like to share our results with you today. We work in the oil and gas pipeline safety industry, and I think we have some novel results that you will appreciate learning about. And in our industry, our customers tend to be very risk averse and they tend to be late adopters of technology. And that's just characteristic of who they are. And so they're asking today if they were to employ machine learning into their safety programs, what would it take? How hard would it be? And to bound that, you could say, do I need a room of PhD data scientists? Or would a group of 10 year olds with their iPhones be enough? Can we just ask Siri? The answer is going to be somewhere on that continuum. And so to answer that question, Becky and I undertook an experiment. We accessed some publicly available data. Data. We ran it through Bayesia Lab, an off-the-shelf tool. And just the two of us, we're eager, we're motivated, we're clever, but we are not experts in machine learning and we don't have PhDs. So given those constraints, seeing how far we can get, I think would tell us pretty clearly where we are, what is the state of the art of applying machine learning into our industry. So for some quick background, first, just three points here. There are millions of miles of oil and gas pipe in the ground in the United States today. Second, our customers operate as operate those pipelines as toll roads. That's their business model. And third, it's a heavily regulated industry by the Department of Transportation. And the group underneath the DOT, Line Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, that's a mouthful, also known as FIMSA, writes and enforces the regulations in our industry. So let me just walk you through our experience as we undertook this, this investigation. First of all, we go on the FIMSA site, we explore around, we find the data sets, we download them. The first thing I'm going to do as an engineer is just open up Excel and see what kind of totals I have. What are we dealing with? I want to get my arms around the data. And so you see here the three main categories of data that FEMSA has published. And you can see how many miles of pipe there are in each one. The number of incidents during our study period, which is 2010 to present, really third quarter, <laughs> excuse me, of 2022 is what the data goes up to how many companies are operating at that time? And then some more interesting numbers. How many incidents involve an injury or a fatality? The total number of injuries, total number of fatalities, and then average and maximum cost of an incident. And then the next thing I would probably do just normally using Excel is to look at some trends. And here's one. This is showing that the number of incidents is decreasing over time. That's good news. And then I might do some histograms like this one, the number of incidents per age of pipe per decade installed. And you see an interesting shape here. If you have experience in the semiconductor industry or consumer electronics, you might recognize this as the bathtub curve. It's a well-known phenomena. So when a product or in any piece of equipment is deployed, Initially, there's a flurry of incidents that you find often from manufacturing defects or packaging or shipping. But then once those are cleared out of the way, you enter bottom part of the bathtub where things tend to be more stable. And then as the product or the asset reaches the end of its life, it starts to wear out and your incident rate goes back up. But I noticed that the amount of pipe installed in a given decade is anything but uniform. There's way more miles installed in the 60s and 70s than in other decades. And so I needed to normalize the data. And when I did that, I still kept the bathtub curve, but instead of a 40 or 50 to year span, it looks like there's more of a 70 year span. So this is interesting. It's an interesting insight. But at this point, I'm pretty much out of what I'm able to do with my basic engineering skills using Excel. And I still have a lot of unanswered questions that begin with what are the chances or what are the likely causes or what are the likely costs? And I don't have answers to those questions. And so when we think about pipeline incidents, we always, at least significant pipeline incidents, 
they're always what we would consider a black swan event. People die, neighborhoods get exploded. It's always a really big deal. They're rare, but they do happen. And so we wanted to look more into the data, but for all sense and purposes, we wanted to share a little bit about what exactly happens when a serious pipeline incident happens. And so this is what a black swan event looks like for us. The worst of the worst is the on the bottom left here, that's San Bruno, California. In 2010, an entire subdivision ba basically ignited and exploded. Over 100 homes got destroyed. 50 people got injured. Eight people lost their lives. And that particular event caused sweeping regulation changes around our industry. All of these examples are things like the one on the top right is a major oil spill that happened recently. Right-of-way fires that ignite pieces of roadway, and then just house explosions. And we, in Andrew and I's world, we work for a company that helps people avoid these kind of things. And so digging into the data was really interesting for us. And talking about the process that we went through, first, we just pulled all of the FEMSA incident data. We just looked at 2010 on. We didn't go back further than the past 13 years and just looked at the incidents. But we hit a brick wall. We were able to get some information out of it, like Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas appear to be the problem children if you're just looking at incidents. But when you're only looking at the incident data, we found that it's like studying patients that only got sick without considering all of the people that didn't, or only looking at a vehicle wreck study that only had wrecks without considering all of the cars that were driving on the road with no wrecks that year. And so to, we found ourselves basically in what we would call the data desert. And we were having a little bit of trouble trying to get the Bayesian network tool to give us what we wanted to get out of it or really conclusive findings. And to get out of this data desert, we looked back at this, all of the miles of pipes that operators have in the ground. When you look at this map, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Yeah, Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma have the highest incident rates because there is by far more pipe in the ground than any other region in the state. I want for some of our findings later in the model, take a look at how little pipe is in California, because we found some interesting things around California specifically with, with the amount of pipes that they have there. Yeah. And then I want to move forward, Andrew. Yeah. And as Becky said, we found ourselves stuck for quite a while. And then late in the game, we happened upon what we were looking for, right? Some gold nuggets of data. So buried deeply in sub tab I of an Excel sheet from a secondary set of public data from FEMSA, we, we found this. We found subtotals of miles by operator, state, commodity, and decade installed. And that gave us the granularity that we needed so that we could compute similar subtotals for incidents. And now we can compute a ratio and a failure rate with a granularity that is much better than just taking the total number of miles in, in the country as a denominator. And so we could compute a likelihood of failure. And I know for this crowd, the word likelihood has a specific technical definition. And so I think the proper term here would be probability. But in our world, that word likelihood of failure is an industry term. It's used interchangeably with probability. And so please don't be offended if I use those terms interchangeably here. But since we were able to compute an LOF and include that in the input of our data, we now could have distributions of LOF and do some assist that we could not otherwise do. Here's our workflow. I think this would be the most familiar to all of you here. We started with our data sets in the upper left, over 600 variables there. Moved those through another tool. In this case, we used NIME, very handy just for transforming aggregating, subtotaling, fed that into a Bayesian lab tool and had pared it down to 68 variables that we felt were the most interesting and that we would probably care about the most. Trained the model with various targets, including unsupervised learning, just ranked the variables of most important and then pared those down to about two dozen. And then we would query that model. And so talking about some of the findings that we got from doing that, 
some of the things that came in as ranking as top contributors, we first we just looked at cost. What is the total cost of a major pipeline incident or not major only all of the incidents? What is the overall impact of a cost of an incident? Some of them we expected things like release amount, how much, how many barrels of oil you spill, if you will, contribute to the cost because of reclamation activities and the like, where it happened, why it happened, the installation year we knew would come into play, and then whether or not water got contaminated. Those were all things we expected. Two things we did not expect, though, was of top, two of the top three contributing variables were who man, who operated the pipe itself and then who manufactured that pipe? We didn't see that coming. It was a very interesting find for us. And then likewise, on the low side, some of the expected low contributors that we knew would come into play were things like likelihood of failure, whether or not they had a SCADA system in place, that supervisory control and data acquisition. It's just a system that they can have in place to help them monitor things and whether or not they had employee drug testing. We didn't think that those things would contribute to the overall cost of a pipeline incident, and that was found to be true. But one thing that we didn't see as necessarily something that we would expect are whether or not an ignition or an explosion happened, we would have thought that would rank higher. Whether or not people died or got seriously injured, whether or not areas got evacuated, and whether or not the pipe went out of service. And so every time this pipe is out of service, as Andrew mentioned, it is essentially a toll road. So we would expect that service interruption would have a direct contribution to cost, and it turns out that it didn't. And then from there, we built just a scenario, if you will. And so we picked one operator. We're not gonna name any names, but we picked an operator. And we said they're hauling crude oil in a pretty standard type of pipe laid in Oklahoma in the 1990s, and it's a U.S. steel pipe. And we took this scenario and we just said, OK, what's the cost profile breakdown and the likelihood of failure breakdown? Likelihood of failure all over the board here. And then overall property cost, pretty broad breakdown. But we're looking pretty likely that it's going to be uh, under $100,000 based off of this breakdown. And so then we expanded on that and we said, what are the likely causes and outcomes of this? And so looking at all of the data that we pulled into the tool, we found that more, more often than not, it's an equipment failure that happens when you're looking at this kind of breakdown. It's probably going to be the pipe, the pump, or a valve. And it's going to be in a, an above ground instance. So you're not going to have to deal with ex excavation to fix it and everything like that. And it, it, the very top one on the right is the location type. That's saying it's going to be on a totally operator con controlled property. It's not going to be on the main pipeline right away, which runs under roads. It runs under major areas and stuff like that. It's looking like it's going to be in an operator controlled property. And then some of the metrics on the bottom, things like soil contamination, that came back with 81%. Yep. And then wildlife, most likely not. Water contamination ranked as a pretty high no, and then no injuries and fatalities as well. From a service interruption standpoint, with this particular scenario, it came out as around 60 hours, which is a couple of days. It's not that big of a deal. And then from there, we said, OK, what is the million dollar event look like using the same scenario? Once you hit the million dollar range, the chances that you, as the person that controls that section of the pipe, you have a chance to get fired, your boss gets scrutinized. And so what do I want to, what do I wonder and about million dollar pipeline a little bit more proactive? In this case, equipment failure is still pretty high up there, but then corrosion failure came into play as well. That, that ranked much higher than just looking at the overall property or property is really cost. And so looking at that. And then in this case, million dollar, it's most likely going to be the pipe itself. It's going to be much higher chance that it's underground and a much higher chance that it's out on the main pipeline. Some other notable changes is that the service interruption hours went way up to you know, the mean value is 162. 
that's essentially a full week of them being out of commission at that point. And then the other change that we noted was that the water contamination value went up significantly as well from the previous scenario. So from there, we started to look at different areas in the country. So again, this is U.S. only data. And we started to think, are there areas that have a higher failure rate than others? If you look at the U.S. as a whole, and the ones that we would expect are Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, because they have the most pipe. But notably, Texas has by far more pipe than anyone else, but their failure rate is pretty low in comparison to Louisiana. We started to think of why that is. Louisiana is a very wet area. And so corrosion probably is, is a bigger player in Louisiana. And so that's a pretty interesting find, something that we can take back to our customer base and share those learnings. But then the other big contributor that we didn't necessarily see coming is California with a higher failure rate than both Texas and Oklahoma, but much lower pipe mileage as a whole. And then we started, and same analysis, only this one's cost instead of failure rate. Louisiana topped the charts at just under a million dollars per incident on average. Again, something to do with that particular state and the geographical inclinations of that state that probably come into play there. California ranked really high as well. That was a really interesting finding, totaling far more per incident than both Texas and Oklahoma in general. So we mentioned earlier that the pipeline manufacturer surprised us being significant. And so I just want to return to that for a moment. So the chart on the left shows the top 10 contributors to uncertainty, and we're targeting risk here. And risk is calculated as likelihood of failure. So LOF times cost, and those are both probabilities. And so that, that number is denominated in dollars. Risk is in dollars per mile per year, just to understand the, the number itself. So in terms of reducing uncertainty of risk, the, these are the top 10 that you see over on the left, but that's just significance. That's not good or bad. It's just influence. And I realize we're naming names here. And so if there's anyone in the audience that is in the steel manufacturing business or manufactures pipes, I'm just going to apologize. You free to see me later. The burning question might be a top 10 and a bottom 10 list of pipe manufacturers if the model analysis is telling us that they matter. And so in the lower, we, we have the top 10 hit list of highest risk per incident on an incident basis. These are the top 10 out of the 84 that are listed in all the incidents, the thousands of incidents that, that we analyzed. And just one unfortunate member here, this Italian pipe manufacturer up there at the top was only listed one time out of the thousands of incidents that, that we analyzed, but it was a big incident. And so unfortunately for them, it completely dominated all the statistics. And then in the upper right, we see the best ones, right? So these are the lowest cost and the scales are not the same. If you look closely at the numbers, there's a, a orders of magnitude difference in risk between these two sets. And so we're tempted to conclude here, again, Becky and I, are, you know, we've got our engineer hats on, right? We're not statisticians. It's tempting to say, okay, customers, pipeline operators, if you're planning to buy some pipe and install new pipe, always consider these 10 and never consider those 10. But I don't think we can make that claim. I think it's overstating. I think it would be conflating correlation with causation. What we can say, and I can give you a couple of examples why. For example, what an operator may be constrained based on prior contractual obligations this is the pipe, the pipe supplier that we go with. And so maybe this is not the independent variable that we believe that it is, or could be something like Nippon Steel, just to pick one in the bottom 10 list, might actually be known to be one of the very best available. And so operators choose them because if they know they're going to operate in difficult or harsh environments, that's the one you want. And so then they're going to show up more frequently with incidents and with cost and with risk. So we can't say definitively, always look here, never look here, but we can say it, it appears to matter a lot 
And so it's worth looking at carefully beyond just cost and delivery date if you're considering a purchase. Another area where we looked, these are just a few other queries that we wanted to run against our trained model. Back to the bathtub curve that I mentioned earlier, it's a little hard to see it but here in the upper left. You have to look closely in that distribution, but the bathtub curve is there starting from about year five and then bottoming out and then coming back up in year 50, 60, 70. And so we just chose three points in the bathtub curve, year one, year 40, and year 80 to see what we found. And so you see these trends and think they're pretty compelling. The significant means the probability that an incident will be significant. And there's a precise definition of that given by FEMSA. It has to do with were there injur injuries, serious injuries that required a hospital visit? Were there any deaths? Was the cost above a certain amount? Was the release amount a above a certain volume? So any of those would mark the incident as significant. And so the probability of it being significant matters. So very low in the first year, only 16%. Very likely going to be an equipment failure, a pump or a valve. It's going to be a seal or a packing failure. It's going to be above ground, higher likelihood, the highest, but lowest cost. And then when you go into the middle of the bathtub, the causes shift. And so now corrosion comes into play. That makes sense. The pipe's 40 years old. It's had an opportunity to corrode. A different kind of leak. It'll be below ground. It'll be your pipe. Lower likelihood, double the cost. And then at the, out at the end of the bathtub curve, 80 years, you see the trends continue, the highest probability of significance. And then alongside corrosion, excavation starts showing up. And that is particularly third-party excavation, where someone is constructing something, they've got a backhoe out there, they don't know your pipe is under the ground, and they start digging and they hit your pipe. That is what excavation means. Again, it'll be the pipe, it'll be underground. The lowest likelihood, four times less likely to occur at the 80-year mark than at the one-year mark, but still a very high cost. So what we see is that early on, it's the incidents tend to be high volume, low impact, and then later lower volume, but higher impact. Another query we ran, this is similar to the million-dollar question. This is my black swan event. This is the nightmare that keeps me awake at night if I'm a pipeline operator. So again, entering who I am as an operator. I'm running crude through Oklahoma. I bought the pipe from US Steel. But this time I'm setting more evidence in my model. I'm saying there is a fatality. There are injuries. There was an ignition. Things were contaminated. The public had to be evacuated. And so this is my worst case scenario. What does it look like? It's telling me it's gonna be a significant release. 1,500 barrels around. It's going to be on the pipe out on the right-of-way in a remote area, more remote. I've got this likelihood profile, 0.2% per mile, keep in mind, per year. It'll be corrosion. It'll be a $10 million event. That's not just me or my boss or his boss. Now the CEO is on the news answering why this happened. And I'm going to be offline for a week and a half. So why is this information helpful to our customers, our the pipeline operators themselves. It's a heavily regulated industry. They must conduct surveys and inspections on a regular basis. They get audited, they get fined if they're not compliant. But there's still some leeway in managing those schedules, especially around inspections. And for example, if I know that this is my worst case scenario, and I want to do something to prevent, and let's say there's a particular kind of survey that I do maybe every five to seven years only, where a crew walks the entire center line of the pipe. I may have that scheduled for next year, but I may decide to bring it in and do it this year instead, because we know that big leaks are preceded by small leaks. And if I've got a crew walking the entire center line of the pipe, they may find small puddles or, or dead vegetation. And we could take remedial action early to excavate the pipe and repair it before there's a major incident. I could hire an airplane to fly the right of way and take a high definition video looking for the same the small leaks that precede. I could pay to have, it's called an inline inspection, an instrumented device called a smart pig runs through the inside of the pipe in the stream and looking for anomalies. I can review shut-in and containment 
procedures. Years back, I worked for British Petroleum and I was working for them at the time of the Exxon Valdez incident in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. And it was a terrible incident. There's a spill. What didn't make the headlines, but what we knew inside British Petroleum is that the tugboats and the floating booms are supposed to be staged and ready for rapid deployment there at the terminal. And they were not. It took many hours to deploy those booms and they were not able to contain the spill. And so they had the outcomes that they had. So just reviewing those policies and the readiness could mitigate the spill from a 1500 barrel event to a 15 barrel event and then lower the likelihood dramatically of ignition or harm to others. It could also do things just as simple as inspecting shut-in valves along the pipe because th those are what contain spills or leaks. Just making sure that they are in place and operational. And so those sort of preventative measures could have a big impact on the frequency or the severity of events. And then finally, our last query that we posed is, does preventative maintenance, like I just described, really help? P part of the data in the public incident, public in the annual report data sets that we pulled includes the number of repair actions that the operators take. So these are not incidents. These are routine maintenance items, and they perform hundreds, sometimes thousands of repair actions per year. And so how much does that help? And the model allows us to quantify that benefit. And I know it's a busy, we've broken every rule of making good slides and I apologize, but it's an information dense study and we, we wanna show you the real numbers. So if you look in the sort of center top, you see the repairs per mile that people conduct. So this, these are the priors, right? And so a quarter of a given segment a quarter of the miles have no repair actions made at all in a given year. And these are based on assessments and inspections. So if we remove those for the moment and just look at the rest of the distribution, you see that the majority conduct one repair per 10 miles in a given year. And we just constructed a curve with these three points. So the average, right, just the priors there in the middle. And then on the left, we say, we're going to do no repairs at all this year, zero. What does it look like that my risk doubles, more than doubles, and the probability that an incident will be significant also goes up by about eight points. And then if I go the other way and say, I'm going to do repairs just like my best neighbors, right? The best citizens in my industry do one repair per 10 miles on average. That's what I'm going to do. And so I entered that evidence that the risk, again, is reduced by half and the probability that an incident will be significant also continues to go down, but not quite so much. There, there is a point of diminishing return, as we would expect. And th this is not only interesting and insightful, but we believe helpful because the maintenance crews for pipeline operators are constantly vying to justify their budgets for coming years. This information can give them quantified justification to, to increase their budgets take more maintenance actions, do more repairs. And if they do, they can immediately at the end of the year assess the outcomes because the incidents are counted and reported. They're required to be so. And can compare those outcomes with say previous three or five years of outcomes and demonstrate, look, when we do more repairs, we have a lower frequency and a lower cadence of incidents. And that's what everyone wants. And so we believe that this could be assistive to our customers and to help lower those incidents. So conclusions, surprising top drivers, who you are and who you purchase from, we did not expect at all, but they were consistently at the top, no matter how we did our analysis. Expect data deserts. I know that's well understood by this audience. We did see a shift in incident profiles with time. That's the bathtub curve. And then to answer the original question, where is the state of the art? Machine learning is definitely accessible in pipeline safety without having a room of experts. Just engineers can do it. It's still plenty of work. It's a lot of effort, but we are not at the point of Siri or chat GPT being able to just answer the questions directly. We're 
nowhere close to that level of maturity. And I would add, there's still no escaping requiring domain expertise and really understanding the data. It's, it is not at the point of taking an Excel sheet or a CSV, dragging it into a window on a web page and having a model emerge that is, is usable and coherent. It's, it is not there. Where could we go from here? As I'm sure you're all familiar, anytime you undertake any investigation, you generate way more leads just as you go. Here are four that, that I've listed. I just want to highlight one that I think will be most interesting for this group. And that's the first one. As I mentioned before, operators tend to perform lots of repairs in a given year, hundreds or thousands. And we think there's an opportunity to go much deeper here and get finer granularity and improve the models. Again, just with public data, this could help a lot with budgeting, with prioritizing and with scheduling. So thank you for listening. I hope this was interesting to you. It was very interesting for us. We'd love to answer your questions now if you have anything for us.